Coming up on Now See This. A globetrotting reporter finds a lead story. What meteorologists call a perfect storm. That's both wet and wild. Aerial daredevils cut through the air like eagles. But flounder in the water. And when a city street turns into a raging river, it's easy to get swept away. If you're shopping for drama and action, call now. It's going fast. Think you've seen it all? Now see this. Mikado Sullivan has a knack for popping wheelies. And for catching tragedy on tape. Boom! When Mikado isn't showing off for the camera, he straps it to the front of his motorcycle and records his biking buds winding through the canyon roads of Los Angeles. Mikado sticks close to fellow rider Orlando Pablo. The two are best friends who cherish their early morning rides. But as they stop for a rest, it becomes clear they would have been better off sleeping in today. Bodies are hurled in every direction, and Orlando is among the victims. Like a bat out of hell, a rider loses control and slams into Orlando, knocking him flat on his face and out cold. I was panicking because I didn't know if he was dead or alive. Mikado has no idea whether he captured the crash, but he makes sure to take the camera with him as he checks on his pals. Yeah, Orlando went down. Somebody hit him. Bert, you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Sure. Yeah. Pat! Is Pat all right? Sit down, dude. Huh? Better sit down. You might be in shock. It's amazing. The other crash victims seem to be unharmed. But when Mikado gets to his best friend, it's a whole other story. Hold still, bud. Hold still. Feel anything? Okay. I'm gonna loosen your helmet. Hold still. No, yeah, hold okay, still. loosen it. Just Don't still. move I'm it. I'm not gonna take it off. Just hold his head. Hold, hold his head. head. I was hold worried head. about taking off his helmet because I didn't know if he sustained a, a broken neck. Wiggle your toes. You're gonna... He could be paralyzed, You're just stop. but as Orlando like comes to, he proves otherwise, and then, uh, asking for his bike rather than an ambulance. For a minute. Where's my bike? It's over there. It's upright. Oh, it? It's nothing major and just a couple of scratches. Don't worry about it. Orlando doesn't remember getting hit, but after watching the crash on tape, he realizes why everyone was in such a panic. God was there to save me. An inch or two more, the guy could have hit me straight on and I could have lost my legs or worse, got killed. With no helmet, I would have been a goner. Police and fire safety roll on scene and give Orlando a good once over. Still, anywhere, know where you're at, know your name. Orlando answers all the questions, slowly. He's got a concussion. Although he's airlifted to a hospital, they release him soon after with just scratches, bruises, and a king-sized headache. To this day, I really don't think I did too much bodily damage, except for maybe losing a couple brain cells after the impact with the ground. The crash may have made this biker a little more safety conscious, but it hasn't scared him off. After all, with his luck, Orlando figures he's safer when he's riding than he is when he's stopped. I had no control of what was gonna happen. I do still do my share of extreme riding on the streets, but not to the extent that I used to. I save it for the racetrack. Skydivers take to the air over Zephyr Hills, Florida. But not everyone will be coming down in one piece. These aerial daredevils are competing in an advanced form of skydiving called pond swooping. 
This new twist is not for sissies. Skydivers must fly faster, lower, and skim perfectly over the water's surface to score big points. Some can hack it, but those who can't get eaten alive. A competitor clips his foot on the water's edge, throwing his landing totally out of whack and snapping his wrist in two. He suffered one heck of a body blow, but it's a cakewalk compared to the pain that awaits diehard skydiver TK Hayes. TK endures a watery faceplant and is slammed flat on his back. When I first sat up after the accident, I sat there for a second and people came over. I could tell just by the look in their face that this was probably a lot worse than I thought it was. His friends raced to his side. They saw him land on his head and expect to find him paralyzed. Instead, they find him angry. My setup wasn't as good as I usually like it. My parachute continues to sink and sink and sink and I'm watching it going up and I'm thinking, oh man, too much speed makes for a disastrous touchdown. I saw water, sky, ground, water, sky, ground, and all in a flash in a second, and I just chowed in. Chowed in is an understatement. It turns out his neck is broken in three places, and surgery is a must. I'm not gonna say I'm as good as new, but I've got a lot of steel in my neck, and, and it's pretty strong. It pains his mother to see him return to teaching others how to skydive. She wishes he'd quit the silly sport before he gets hurt again. I said, Mom, I had a bit of an accident, which has been her biggest fear for 20 years of skydiving for me. TK loves his mom, but he's no mama's boy. He's back in the air, still banged up, but the wiser for it. I probably should have played it a little smarter. Ocala, Florida where Corporal Gregory Martin has one hand on the wheel and the other on the radio, coordinating units in pursuit of a hard-charging pickup. The synchronized attack is essential because this guy has gotten away before. Suspect Lamar Scott and his friend just fled the scene of a disturbance call. Scott already has warrants for fleeing and eluding, and it looks like he still has some tricks up his sleeve. Martin can't handle the turn in time. But before the suspect can pull away, in swoops Officer Lisa Garceau, who takes over the lead. The numbers are starting to work for police. But it'll take more than numbers to safely nab this suspect. Scott is driving double the speed limit in quiet neighborhoods, and police don't want any innocent bystanders getting hurt. Hoping to slow Scott down, Garceau requests that tire shredding spikes be deployed. But Scott's moves are unpredictable, making spikes almost impossible to position. For safety's sake, Cruz orders additional units to stand down. But then, a lucky break. Scott turns directly toward a police roadblock. Just ahead, a unit has traffic stopped on the shoulder and a set of spikes positioned on the ground. Maybe there will be a safe ending to this pursuit after all. Or maybe not. Signal four, big time signal four, Gala. We need EMS ASAP. As the pickup spins to a stop, Garceau jumps out to secure Scott. But he's not in the truck. He got ejected from the vehicle. Martin hurries onto the scene, and they soon find Scott in the nearby grass. Amazingly, he has to be restrained to keep him from running again. Seconds later, Scott's passenger emerges from the cab, surprisingly unhurt. Police don't know whether he's a victim or an accomplice, but right now, they're not taking chances. Unfortunately, there are people on the scene who have been injured, and that's where their priority lies. Scott's attempt to swerve around the spike sent him skidding onto the right shoulder and his overcorrection slammed him into two civilians. In the first car, an innocent motorist escapes with minor injuries. The second driver also sustains only minor injuries, but this is no innocent motorist. 
It turns out the driver of the second car is a drug dealer, and police find his wrecked sedan loaded with cocaine. Notify uh, the A3 as well, man. It appears that Scott, the man who instigated this whole mess, is about to get a little company for his trip to the station. When officers see an opportunity to end a chase safely, they have to take that chance. For one heart-stopping moment, it looked like the worst-case scenario. But when the dust settled, police ended up with two busts for the price of one. A torrential downpour in Kiev, Russia, has turned a neighborhood street into a major flood channel. Residents were caught completely off guard by the rapidly rising stormwaters. Two people are now stranded in this hatchback, right in the middle of the road. Suddenly, their car shifts. The surging current is threatening to carry the vehicle downstream and into a major wash. One neighbor has run to get his truck to help pull them out, but there may not be time. The stranded motorists consider bailing out, but before they can act, a man tries coming to their rescue. He soon discovers the water's brutal strength. He struggles to stand up, but the shifting weight of the car and the pounding flow are about to gain a heart-stopping upper hand. The man is trapped underwater, in danger of drowning in the middle of the street. Suddenly, he bobs up out of the water downstream. It's a terrifying moment as the man gets swept under. One gasp for air would mean a choking lungful of water. Incredibly, the man splashes to the surface, still conscious, and the two helpers are able to pull him free. Everyone else wisely waits for the truck to arrive. And with a group effort on the tow line, the stranded motorists are finally saved. There's no denying this man's bravery and good intentions. But the old maxim still holds. Discretion is the better part of valor. In the mountains of Guatemala, two dolphins are in serious trouble. An army of volunteers and government workers race against the clock to return them to sea before they die. But how did dolphins wind up hundreds of miles away from the ocean in the first place? Until a few days ago, these intelligent creatures were part of a traveling marine wildlife show. Like many other sea creatures, they were mistreated for the sake of the show, according to dolphin expert Rick O'Berry. They were captured illegally being trained for this traveling dolphin show, which is the most abusive dolphin show in the world. Rather than face the law, the show owners abandoned them. Hours ago, the team found Turbo and Ariel in the filthy pond, swimming in their own waste, their bodies covered with sores. An international rescue effort springs into action, led by O'Berry, a former trainer himself. I started actually capturing dolphins and training them back in the 1960s. Of course, in those days, we didn't have the information that we have today. Today, we know that captivity kills. He should know. O'Berry trained the dolphins for the hit TV show, Flipper. But now he works tirelessly to release them back into the wild. O'Berry and his team from the World Society for the Protection of Animals quickly transfer them into this sanitary holding tank. The playful dolphins are much happier, but still not out of danger. Uh, there's no way they can be healed here. They're at a dead end. The clock is ticking as they prepare them for the journey. A veterinarian administers medicine. Volunteers cover their delicate skins with lanolin cream for a long, hard ride. The tiny village pitches in, as does the Guatemalan army, who lends a hand as well as their cargo plane. In these specially made boxes, it takes an hour in the air, 40 minutes over crude roads, and another 20 minutes by chopper to reach the coast where the healing can begin. Once they're in natural seawater, they can experience the natural rhythms of the sea and the tide and the current, and this has healing properties. 
Turbo and Ariel are released into a two-acre saltwater pen. Only time will tell if they will fully recuperate or not. It will take weeks before O'Berry and his team can reverse all the damage done to them in only 15 months of captivity. The first order of business? The dolphins must learn to catch and eat live fish again. If they show us that they're candidates to be released to catch their own fish, they're using their sonar, we'll then consider releasing them. Finally, after nearly two months, the rescuers think the dolphins are ready to return to their natural habitat. It's a joyful occasion. They're ready to go. Today is a wonderful day because they're gonna get their life back. Most of these dolphins that end up in captivity die in captivity. These two are very lucky. They're gonna get their life back. The team dismantles the pen. Within a few hours, Turbo and Ariel venture out into deep waters. They immediately make friends and feel right at home, a world away from their death tank in the mountains. And after months of mistreatment and performing in deadly shows, the dolphins are now back in the wild, jumping for joy in the open waters off Guatemala, thanks to these determined rescuers. A boring night in Wichita, Kansas is about to get interesting. Deputy Sheriff Tom Prunier patrols this stretch of road from midnight to past dawn. It's called the third shift, and it's usually the routine stuff. He never would have anticipated such a bizarre crash. But on this night, his dash-mounted camera captures the whole incident on tape. Prunier recounts the last thing he remembers before impact. I went up and made contact with him. Next thing I know is I hear screeching tires, look over and see a car on the wrong side of my patrol car. And Driving under the influence of alcohol, a woman careened off the road and viciously rear-ended the van, driven by Corey Hankins. The van was totaled. I mean, not drivable. It, it, was, it, was, it just got new tires and everything. Corey had been the designated driver that night after some fun and fishing at a nearby lake. This was just uh, a perfect night, ended the wrong way. They measured her skid marks, and she was going probably about 65, 70 miles per hour. With less than a second to respond to the oncoming car, instinct took over and probably saved Prenier's life. I noticed watching the video in slow motion that I took one step back, put my hands on the van, so I guess those two little maneuvers really saved me. Had he not, the van would have crushed him. Dazed and confused, Deputy Pernier stumbles to the side of the road. But after regaining some clarity, the man meticulously goes about doing his post-accident routine. I walked over to check on the occupants of the van. I was very confused because I thought the passenger in the van was driving the car for uh, about a minute. In fact, the driver who caused this was sitting quietly beside her badly damaged car. This lady that hit us, she didn't say one word, and you could tell she was, she was drunk. Even though she almost killed him and the two kids in the van, Deputy Pernier's professionalism wins out. He walks over to the woman to see if she's all right. It's an odd feeling when you talk to someone that almost kills you, but you still have a job to do, and their health and welfare is the primary goal at that point. The final irony to this near tragedy is Corey Hankins didn't even have a valid driver's license that night. He got off with a warning. The cop, he was a real nice guy. But Deputy Pernier got a warning from his wife and family to get a new routine. I think they're ready for me to leave third shift. When a hurricane hits, most people run away or run inside. But Jeff Mackley is a little different than most people. Cyclone Vance is one of the most powerful storms ever to hit Australia. Jeff is a storm chaser and cameraman whose life's mission is to capture the worst Mother Nature has to offer. I'd go to the ends of the earth to be in front of a Category 5 storm or to see a big volcanic eruption. 
From his home base in Auckland, New Zealand, Jeff monitors weather patterns around the globe. When a cyclone forms anywhere on Earth, he packs up his gear and races ahead of the path of destruction, often flying in on turbulent winds just before the airports are shut down. Someone once called me like a Navy SEAL with a camera, and you kind of do have to be like that because the only reason I turn up with better pictures than everyone else is because I seem to be able to get into places that no one else wants to. Once he's in those places, Jeff captures weather in the most raw and ferocious state. And if he has the chance, he'll even conduct live interviews and field reports. This is what, this is what meteorologists call a perfect storm, a category five cyclone. For the three or four hours during the strongest part of a storm passing over you, you would be in the most dangerous place on earth without doubt. But when Jeff's behind the camera, danger is the last thing on his mind. You are only focused on one thing, and that's keeping the water off the lens, keeping the camera going, and getting the best possible pictures. Your whole world is a little two-inch black and white viewfinder, and you're just like part of the camera. But Jeff doesn't only film crashing waves and thrashing trees. When Cyclone Drina hits New Zealand, his camera captures a much more human drama. I was out and about filming for the local television station when I heard over the police scanner that a boat was about to smash up on the rocks. Jeff arrives on the scene to find an intrepid young man rowing a small rowboat toward the endangered yacht. The boiling seas toss both vessels like they're toys in a bathtub. Call him brave or crazy, the young man leaps on board the yacht and tries to wrangle the expensive boat away from the rocky shore. But the waves are simply too powerful. There was not a thing he was ever going to be able to do to stop it smashing up. Now the young man is trapped. Yet even as the yacht heaves beneath him, he remains remarkably composed. The police on shore desperately want to bring him in, but they're helpless. So the man finally decides to help himself. The gathered crowd holds its breath while he makes his move. Jeff's camera is riveted as the young man calmly steps off the bounding yacht and into the tiny rowboat. Once the boat is pulled through the churning water, he leaps onto shore with the same cool confidence. Within moments, the yacht is smashed into oblivion against the rocks. But who was the mystery man who risked his life to save the boat? We find out later that he didn't even own the boat. He was just driving past and saw it, and he grabbed a rowboat from somewhere and rowed out and tried to save it. Part heroism, part insanity. It was the kind of bold act a dangerous tempest can inspire in people. Especially someone like Jeff Mackley, storm chaser, cameraman, and no stranger to staring down the fury of a hurricane the greatest show on earth. It's a humbling thing to be in because humans are totally, uh, totally powerless to, uh, to do anything about it. And it's, it's just a, it's a fantastic thing to witness. And... At a Florida grocery store, Petty Larceny is on special. Three shifty shoppers casually stroll the store looking to clean out unsuspecting customers. Their target is an elderly woman who's too busy checking out the cheese to notice the trio is zeroing in on her wallet. The guy distracts the victim with mindless chit chat about cheddar while one of his female partners slips her wallet out. Meanwhile, the other woman makes sure they aren't being watched. These are some smooth criminals who make stealing look simple, but not everyone is an easy target. The female bandits ditch their male partner and head to another part of the store, where they spot another elderly victim with their purse out in the open. 
But unlike the last woman, this one puts her guard up and her hand over her purse. They walk away with nothing this time. Police expert detective Sean Cohen took a look at the store's security tape and breaks down the dirty game of pickpocketing. He's gonna distract her, and then his crew is gonna come in and actually do the pickpocketing, watch. This woman doesn't have a clue. She's thoroughly engaged in her conversation with this guy. Her clueless behavior cost her all her cash, a cool 500 bucks. You need to be aware of your surroundings, people invading personal space, making you feel uncomfortable. Supermarkets are a breeding ground for thieves. But this customer's quick thinking proves you can't avoid becoming a victim. This lady instinctively feels surrounded. She made the grab for her purse. It didn't work. Probably be my guess if we were to talk to this woman, she might have already been a victim of this in the past and has developed this kind of a survival skill to keep her purse intact. The women split up and dash for the door where store management detains them and their male accomplice until police arrive. The store called the cops as soon as their security system picked up the thieving trio. How many adults does it take to go grocery shopping? Those are things that would strike you as odd. You don't have to be a genius to avoid being a target. You just need to shop smart. Just presence of mind of keeping your objects close to you. Life is basically a survival game. You need to be aware of your surroundings.